hopefully it goes okay. So far, so good. Right. And we'll have our tea and just have a chat. There we are. Absolutely. So. So. There we are. I thought maybe we'll have a chat about the Gordon Higginson Fellowship. Uh huh. And if you want to share with people, because this is going to be uploaded onto YouTube. Well, the Gordon Higginson Fellowship came out of. really an admiration for and a wanting to have a continuity of that name, Gordon Higginson, because Gordon himself was such a unique man. He, and not only was he a unique man, but he was an enigma. Because he was so unusual, it was just the impact that he had on life. I mean, one could never really estimate it because he didn't just know people that were very influential, but had links with the aristocracy. And I know for a certain, although he never said it, that he had connections with members of our royal family. Yeah. And not only that, he also had great impact on other nations, leaders of other nations. And that his influence and his story, I think, could never be told. And it was because of this that, you know, myself, we wanted to start the Gordon Vincent Fellowship in memory of what he stood for, because I didn't see that that memory was really kept alive in the moment. Yeah. He'd gone, his work was finished and that was it. He was something of the past for many people. Not for all by any means, but for many people. But the influence of the man on spiritualists and the SNU for the many years that he was uh, the president of that union was tremendous. Tremendous. There was no one that could compare with him, and there isn't anyone that can compare with him now. Yeah. Who, uh, uh, you know, their mediumship, their charisma, their personality, their knowledge, their wisdom, the things that were there within him were just remarkable. But at the same time, he was a human yeah. person. He got angry. He disliked people. Yeah. He had strong political motivations. He was very much uh, uh, very, very labour orientated, very socialist, as indeed I am as well. But at times could be quite intolerant of other people's political beliefs. So there was also within what this man was this fallibility, yeah. this frailty of personality, and also the fact of what he was as a human being. You see, all these things add up to the enigma of what he was. But his influence on myself and his influence on people like Ivan Davis, etc., and other people besides, I think, don't think you can ever measure it. And that's why I have, you know, starting the um, uh, uh, Gordings Fellowship, because I started it with uh, uh, Mark Webb and yeah. uh, Stephen, and we got other people involved. And um, it was to keep alive what the man stood for 
and hopefully we have. It's been a struggle, mm. like everything new is a struggle. There's been times when you wonder whether you can financially go on. Mm. But, somehow or other we buckle through, and now I feel that there is an opening and an opportunity to take it even further. Which is brilliant. Which, 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 which will be marvellous, really. So what about, you know, obviously Gordon, his name, a lot of, a lot of mediums these days may have heard of his name, and he's a pioneer, obviously, of spiritualism. So, and you had that contact with oh, him. Oh, very much. Uh, and I know you were the best friends. Uh, so is there any nice personal stories that you'd like to share? Gordon could be very... You could never pin Gordon down to anything. But I remember I rang him up. And I said, I desperately need to see you. Oh, he said, OK. That's he would always say yes. And then you turn up, he wasn't there, but he would <laughs> say yes to everybody. Like, uh, it was like a pin in, pin in, in the middle of a poke, where am I going to go, with that? where the wind that? And so he went. Yeah. Because he never kept a diary yeah. at all. He got other people to keep one for him, but never kept to it anyway. But you see, the point of it was, he said yes, come down. He said, because I'm at the hall, and I finish up the time that I'm at the hall, and I'm coming straight home to go to a committee meeting at the church. Go to Hazel's, which is his sister, and I'll see you there. About eight o'clock, we'll have our dinner together first before, before I see you. So I said, OK. So I arrived, and I arrived about seven, and I knew Hazel very well, and yet knew his sister very well. And he, 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 he said he'd be there for eight. Well, nine came, <laughs> ten came, eleven came. 12 came, 1 o'clock, he arrived in the morning. It was bright in his breeze. Oh, hello, how are you? Sorry, I'm a little late. A little <laughs> late? It was hours late. And she kept it and turned it off. And then, so she, she, he said, oh, no, he said, just warm it up. So he sat down and he had his dinner and he was making jokes and cracking jokes and off he was, as he usually was, as though, you know, life was wonderful. He was never awkward in that way. He was always so, so jolly. And I thought, I, I can't let him work and give me a sitting and deal with my problems. Oh no, he said, I, I come here and uh, uh, I'll see you, I'll see you. I'll do you can write you that. And so about half past one, I said, are you ready? That's in the morning. Yeah. He took me upstairs into one of the bedrooms and sat down and worked for over an hour on the situations that I was facing, which was to do with my spiritual involvement, to do with uh, the complexity of um, what was right, what was wrong with life, etc., etc. And he just dealt with it so wonderfully as he always did. Uh, all you had to do was say yes or no to him. And um, he, so he sat and he talked about how we were there for a few minutes, talked to me, went downstairs, we had a couple of train. train. It was about three o'clock in the morning when he said goodbye. Wow. So he gave you time? It, 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 it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And what came over in that was the fact it did not matter how busy he had been there. I mean, he had been at the hall as well for a few days, taught there, done that, he went somewhere else and somewhere else, but he came back and dealt with his ministerial duties, as he would do, and as president of his church, and, did that, and still came along to his sisters at one o'clock in the morning, yeah. had his meal and still did the sitting and insisted on doing it because I had come down, that he did, wouldn't break a promise. You see, there was that in Gordon, that he was able to push aside his own personal wants and needs to serve other people. And then there would be times that he would, you know, 
say he'd come, and he wouldn't come, and he'd be somewhere else. And that's why there was an enigma, really. But at no time in what he did, did he not do it to serve and help other people. Mm. Yes, there were times when we got mad at him and, uh, because of some of the things he did. But in the end, you forgave him because this man would achieve 300 odd public engagements a year, plus his work at Stansted Hall and his work as a minister and as a president of his own church. I don't know how he did it. Mm. So it's, there was obviously a guiding force of power that was with him the whole time mm. to, to get him through this, but do you feel today that mediums don't sit long enough? Do you know, no, this they, don't, they don't sit long enough because, you see, Gordon could walk on a platform looking like a corpse because he was so exhausted and so tired. And he'd start to work with the spirit world and you would visibly see him become pink. Mm. And that all, all the life would come back into him. And I can understand when he went through his strokes, when he spoke to Eric Hatton about losing his gift, losing his gift, which he didn't. Because and he, he said to him, but it's my life, Eric, it's my life. Because when he touched the spirit, no matter how bad he was, he came to life. So it wasn't just his life, it was his life. Because from a child he'd sat and sat and sat with his mother. Yeah. And she would take him off the platform and say, no, it's not good enough, sit again, sit again. But even in the after years, when he was president of the union, he'd go around to do a church service. And He'd always arrive a couple of hours before and sit. Some people accused him that he did it so that he could find out information. People accused him of all sorts of things. But you see, it's so easy to accuse somebody so remarkable of doing something, mm -hmm. of being fraudulent in this something or other. I never found it that. I never found when I had a sitting with him or anything that he would deal with anything that he knew of. Never. Never. And that always, always, he was at hand to serve, to give, to help, to encourage. And he did do it. There's no doubt about that. But you see, sitting for Gordon wasn't just a certain amount of time, but sitting for Gordon was the whole of his life. Because in that quiet, in that sitting, it allowed him to attune. Mm. And as he attuned, it refined what he was. This is why he was so great. This is why he was so brilliant. So what do you think that mediums are missing today from the likes of Gordon Higginson? Is there something that mediums are missing? They're, they're missing the opportunity to know the greatness that can come in the life of someone who is an instrument of the Spirit. Because that greatness that was there with him was an inspiration. He inspired so many of us. Yeah. Because he had something. But the usual thing of uh, 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 a moth round a candle flame is that because he shone so bright or brightly, people wanted from him, wanted from him, wanted from him. Instead of wanting from him the real fruit, which was the encouragement to become. And a lot of people who did, uh, would know what I was talking about, would know the value of the man, you see. But not only that, uh, what the man was, because of him passing to the spirit world 20 years ago and us carrying on, I, I have found 
the life of that man, Gordon Higginson, has continued to be an inspiration to me. Yeah. And, as you know, myself, I've gone through tremendous problems in my health and this and the other, and uh, losing my confidence and having fears about my mediumship and everything else, and yet still facing that fear, still going on. Because what Gordon was, he didn't let his strokes interfere. He didn't let anything, he wanted to carry on and carry on and carry on and carry on, because what he did was his life. And I think that what a lot of us may miss in uh, the work that we do is a realisation that what we do is really the source of our life. And that's why I think mediumship is a vocation. Yeah. Because it's, it's something that is part of you. You can't, you can't not be what you are. And I think that what Gordon was in his generation was, was the living example of that. And we have the privilege of doing it. And I think for many mediums these days, the temptations of all sorts of things of their name of fame, etc., which is fine, and good luck to them. I, you know, why shouldn't they go and become television stars and know naturally if they've got a good gift? But I wonder sometimes if that name fame is enough. Because I think that what it must be is what Gordon said to Eric. It's my life. Yeah. It's my life. What about, um, you know, you've done obviously a workshop with us over the weekend, the last few days, and you kept going back to the point of if you really want to be a good medium, uh, to truly understand your mediumship. So would you like to share maybe a few words on that? Well, understanding your own mediumship is taking notice. Taking notice within yourself of that that you do, of how you feel this sensation, of how you see that image, of how you hear that something that's spoken to you, how you know. Because what has to happen is the fact that you are undergoing that experience. Yeah. And there, as you are, all the doubts and the uncertainties and the worries, is it true, is it real, are there. But accept them as natural things. Don't let them become a problem. Just accept that it's natural to doubt, natural to be unsure. But and the spirit world can work with you and through that as you can work through it. But when it becomes something, that it becomes so self-evident that it imposes, oh, I don't believe that, oh, I don't accept that, oh, that's not true, that can't be the spirit world. Yeah. And we dismiss it out of hand. We're creating a fog in the mind that doesn't allow us to see and feel and know what the reality is that we are experiencing. So it's very important that we acknowledge, I've had this experience. But we don't have to name it as this, that or the other until we are sure. Yeah. You see, a lot of people are pushed by tutors that they've got to prove survival, they've got to do it this way. This is the right way, that is the right way. It is not. The right way is why what happens to you and the right way to teach is not to impose your beliefs, your ideas, on anyone else, but to encourage them. And encourage them through all the uncertainties and doubts that they have to face. Because the human condition is that it has to break through the, if you like, barrier, which is not a barrier, of 
uh, how we've been educated to accept and believe what is true, what is false. Yeah. You see? So realize that people are facing, in a sense, a lot of us are adult and have uh, sort of come to a point in our life where we have charge of our life. And we're used to making decisions and doing things. But you see, once we go back to this sense of the spirit world, we're faced with the challenge of something that is not visible, not visible, not something we can touch and grasp physically. Yeah. But does that mean to say it's not real? Awareness is the reality. So, what the person is aware of, that's what they've got to take notice of. But when they're in, or amongst people that say, oh no, it's not this way, it's not that way, they are wrong. What would you say to people that were complete skeptics of this topic, the subject, mediums, mediumship in general? If they're complete skeptics and they're not prepared to accept it, they want to explain it away, then it's far better that they don't involve themselves in it. Because there will always exist, within the experience of the human states of consciousness, things that point to the mind's presence. And if there isn't the mind's presence, then the experience isn't real anyway. Yeah. Because this something does not come without our participation. So it needs our feelings, our reactions, our mind to be part of it. This is why you will always see within all these miraculous things, experiences, aspects of the human consciousness function. Whatever they are, whether they're visions of the Virgin Mary or things that we as mediums do in endeavouring to give evidence. You see, a lot of people say that you and I would ask too many questions. But that isn't so. Because really what we're doing is, when we're getting a, we want to know if something is real. Yeah. And I suppose that's our lack of confidence speaking. Yeah. But you see, when those of us, such as you and I, and many others, who have at the heart of it a concern for the well-being of people, is that we don't want to make the mistake of the wrong thing, and of imposing the wrong thing. And so each time that we work, in our mediumship, in our demonstration, in our sittings, we improve the quality of that contact. You see, these people that dismiss out of hand in their scepticism what these realities are, are not conscious of the other things that are done. Yeah. So, people like Darren Brown, who, uh, you know, would point out that this and that and the other. You see, the world that we deal with of the spirit does not link to the logical of the human. But the logic of the human has got to touch the infinite logic of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And what is that? That's what you and I are discovering. And that's what these sceptics need to discover. What is the logic of the spirit? Mm. Because once we touch it, really touch it, we realise that the fallibility of the human mind and experience alters and changes. Because we begin to experience that that fallibility doesn't exist in truth. Yeah. I think this is what we've got to do. And all where skeptics are too is just give them the right to be so. But they must give us the right. 
That's it. To be and believe as we be and believe. Because I know that I am not fooling myself. And the question is, Angela, are you? No. Well then. You see, the point here is, when they turn around and say to us, it's this, that and the other, what they're saying is that we've no intelligence. Mm. We've no discernment. And the other thing is, you don't have to be a medium to have experiences with no, this world. No, you don't. No, you There's don't. so many people out there that have had experience you don't. from younger or in the past, when their loved ones are dying. So, you know, normal everyday people are having these experiences. You, you see, what happens with sceptics is exactly what they are, yeah. sceptics. You know when they say that they're open-minded, they are not. Because open-mindedness is not sceptical. Yeah. It's it is exactly what it says it is, open-minded. Yeah. And therefore willing to permit something to prove or disprove itself by what it is itself. Not by coming up with reasons. We can come up with for reasons about everything. We can turn around and say, this cup of tea that I'm holding doesn't exist. It's an illusion. But it's only there because you believe it. Yeah. But it isn't. It's there. It's real. Yeah. Buddhists talk about impermanence. Impermanence means that everything changes. That's all it does. Yeah. And we as spiritualists, we as mediums, know that this impermanence of human life carries on after we finish with human life. Because the breath that we breathe is the spirit that we are. And it passes from one state of existence to another. What happens now is still yet a mystery. It's true. It's true. I think that's, that's, that's what we've got to realise. And whenever we're faced with scepticism, whenever we have these people say, oh, it can't be, it doesn't, that's fine. Mm. It can't be, it isn't for them. Mm. But don't turn around and push down our throats what you believe or they believe to be true. Thank you, Glenn. That was lovely. Thank Pleasure. you so much. Pleasure. Great. Let's Pleasure. just step this. Hold on. Hopefully it went. Happy days have we got it all. <laughs>